of our hearts and minds to be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This morning ends our five-week journey, I believe it was, through the book of Hebrews, and we wind up with Hebrews chapter 11, which is known as the... Does anybody here know what it's known as? The faith chapter, right, very good, because it starts out with what faith is, right? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. If everything is black and white and everything is simply put out there so it's either this or that, there's no need for faith, right? If it's either this way or that way, I don't have to have faith in anything. In order for me to have faith, it's something that I can't understand. It's something that I have to put my trust into, right? I don't understand what God is doing all the time. But do I trust God, what he's going to do with my life? And then chapter 11 continues on to talk about people of the faith, right? Talks about who's first? Abel, thank you. (laughs) Abel? who gave a better gift to God and was seen as good by God. And what happened to him because of that? His brother killed him. But he still lives on as an example of faith. And then the next one brought up in Hebrews chapter 11 is Enoch. And Enoch was just taken. He never died because he lived a life of faithfulness and trust in God. And then it talks about Noah. And Noah did what? He built the ark, right? And how many animals were on the ark? All of them. And how many of each animal were on the ark? No. Who said that? Say it louder. Two or seven. Two or seven. Y'all, it was two, right? That's what I was taught a long time ago. It was only two of each animal. No, there were seven of some because of liturgical reasons. Right? So it's not two is not the right answer. There was actually seven. Go back and read that story again. We're not going to read it right now. But Noah built an ark. And why did he build an ark? Because it was raining. Was it raining when he built the ark? No. Why did he build the ark? Because God told him to. And he believed it. And where was Noah? Was he close to the water? No. He wasn't. How many of you have ever seen Evan Almighty? It's a funny movie, you should rent it, you should watch it. It's a good movie, it has a good story, it has a good underline to it. But it's about a senator who gets a call from God to build an ark in Washington, D.C. Now there's water close to Washington, D.C., but where his home is located, there's no water. So he's building this big boat in the middle of this neighborhood. And people are calling him crazy and weird. And he's actually walking around in robes and where it has a long beard. It's really, it's an interesting movie, you should watch it. There's a lot of good thoughts in there too. But he was building this boat because God told him to. And he believed that God was calling him to do this and he stepped out on faith and he built the boat. Just like Noah. And Noah went out and gathered all the animals and brought them back and put them on the boat. And how many days were on the boat? That's how long it rained. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. They were on the boat for a really long time. Because God said this needed to be done. And Noah trusted God and believed what God was telling him. And regardless of what anyone else said to him, he did what God called him to do. Then there's Abraham, right? And Abraham was called by God to go to a land that he didn't know where he was going to. How many of you, if I told you, we're going to go on a trip, we're going to leave tomorrow, pack everything in your house because we're not coming back, who would want to go? I'm not going to tell you where we're going. I'm not going to tell you how long it's going to take us to get there. Nobody? Not even my family. Oh, at least my wife is raising her hand. (laughs) Not even my family wants to go with me. My wife at least raised her hand. I've done this to them a few times. (laughs) That's what God did to Abraham. Abraham was settled in his land and he had a wife. And and God said to him, get up and go and take all of your belongings and, and I'm going to send you to a land that I'm going to give to you. 
and it's going to be better than anything you could possibly know. And Abraham didn't question. He packed all of his stuff up and he left. And he followed after God. And God not only promised Abraham a land, but God promised him that he would be the father of many nations, right? And how many offspring did Abraham have? This is actually a trick question. At least two, right? Because he had, I'm trying to remember his first son's name, with his wife's slave. Um, and then he had Isaac with Sarah. Right? At Ishmael first. And then he had Isaac with Sarah. He had at least two offspring. We don't know how many, but Isaac was the offspring with Sarah, the promised one, right? The the one that would start the descendants that would outnumber the stars in the sky or the grains of sand on the beach. Have you ever tried to count the grains of sand on the beach? Or the stars in the sky. It's almost an impossible task because by the time that you started to count the sand, the water would come in and move it. So now you've got to start all over again. And as you look in the sky, the sky moves too, right? So there's more stars or sand than you could ever count. And Abraham didn't have a child and Abraham was old. How old was Abraham? What? 112 I got over here. That's a little old. This is a little old. Nine, what? She's just stopping numbers. 107. No, he was 99. And I asked you what, and you didn't repeat it. No, she changed her number when you said 99 that. was how old Abraham was when Isaac was born. And how old was Sarah? All of you mothers out there? How old was Sarah when she had Isaac? 90. Old 90. She was 90. How many of you would like to have a child when you're 90? That was their promised child, their first child together. Abraham believed what God had told him was true and that that was going to happen. Regardless of how old he and Sarah was, he believed it because he was told by God that it was going to happen. How many of us believe when we're told by God something's going to happen that it's actually going to happen? And Abraham left his homeland, took his family, had Isaac, and then Jacob was the offspring of Isaac, and none of them saw what Abraham was promised. They saw glimpses of it. They saw shadows of it. They saw the, the, the comings of it, but they never actually got to see the promise. They died without realizing the promise. Because that's what faith is, right? Right? This puzzle box that I showed to the kids up here this morning, and my daughter said very quickly that you don't have all the pieces. I don't. If you want to look in this box, there's no way that there's 550 pieces in this box. <laughs> you want to know why there's not 550 pieces in this box? Who remembers why there's not, other than my family? This box has been out in this sanctuary before. There is a board in my office in the corner. Doug said it. There's a board in the corner of my office that has the actual border of this puzzle on it. Because I took the time to get all the border pieces out, get them and put them together, and I glued them down to a board in my office. In every congregation I've been at, I've preached a sermon about how we all need to come together to make the picture that God wants us to make. So, there are people in Ohio that have pieces to this puzzle. There are people in Texas that have pieces to this puzzle. And, and people here, unless you threw them away, have a piece to this puzzle. Because it's not about just one person putting together a picture. It's not about God just putting together our lives and making that be the picture that God wants to show the world. It's about all of us being together in the picture that God's creating. It's about us walking together in faith and doing what God has called us to do. It's about us walking together and doing the things that God is leading us to do. It's about us coming together as one body and living His love out in the world. Not doing our own thing, not leading our own way, but doing what God has led each and every one of us to be a part of 
so that God can paint the picture that God needs to paint. Because it's not about each and every one of our individual lives or each and every one of our own thoughts and ways. It's about the way that God is leading us to be and who God is wanting us to come together to show the world His grace and mercy and love. This past week, there was over a thousand ELCA Lutherans gathered in Milwaukee for church-wide assembly. And, and I've seen lots of stuff on Facebook about this assembly and things that happened and really good things that happened, and really bad things that happened. There was a celebration of the 50th year, how many of you realize this? Celebration of the 50th year of women's ordination. Is that something to be, for us to be proud of? Yes and no. Why did it take us so long? The church has been in existence for 2,000 years. Why did it take us so long to recognize this group of people as leaders in the church? Don't get me wrong, it's a big thing. I'm glad that we have women ordained, and it's been 50 years, but why did it take us so long to get there? There was the 10th anniversary of, dare I mention it, the 2009 church-wide decision where the church allowed homosexuals to be in lifelong committed relationships and be leaders in congregations. I know several people who are of a different persuasion than I am, and there are wonderful leaders in this church, and I wonder why did it take us so long to get to this point, because we can't see the picture that God is painting for us. We decided not to be a part of something that many other denominations are a part of, simply because it seems to us to be works righteousness, and we can't get over the fact that sometimes we have to do stuff as Lutherans to be able to be God in the world. But we did declare, as the first denomination in the United States, that we are a sanctuary church, meaning that anyone who wants to can come and take sanctuary in any one of our denomination's congregations. Now, what does that mean? There's still a lot of paperwork to work out on that. But that's a bold statement to say that someone who is coming and needs to have asylum, this is a place that you can come Someone who is coming and needs help, this is a church that is willing to, take a, to put a hand out and to lift you up rather than turn you away. That's the step of faith that, that Hebrews is talking about. That's the step of faith that each and every one of us has to do. We have to let go of what we have, our preconceived notions of what life and our, and our congregations are going to be about, and look to the people outside of us and where God is calling us and leading us to go into the world. Because it's about God using us. To share his love. And that's what faith is. Faith is alive in the actions that we do. And faith is something that God has given to us. So that we can go into the world. And share his love with everyone else. So remember that you're only merely a piece. Of the puzzle that God is painting. And allow him to use your life. To make that picture be as vibrant and beautiful as God can. Because it's going to be more beautiful. If we let him have control. Than we could ever make it. And live that love out loud in the world so that everyone can know exactly how much God loves you and loves them.